Hello, Malaysia, and welcome to another edition of Medical Today. I'm Jared Rutnam. Now, on today's show, we've got uh, some very interesting news for you with regards to dementia. If you didn't know what dementia is, we're going to walk you through that shortly. We're also going to give you a bit of a one-on-one -on, -one on diabetes or what's known scientifically as diabetes mellitus. That's coming up very, very soon. But for now, let's talk about pharmaceutical logistics uh, to ensure safe delivery of medicines to the public. Of course, uh, this segment is brought to you by Pharma Nyaga. Now, um, Vinodini Chandrasegran spoke to Abdul Malik Muhammad, the Director of Logistics and Distribution uh, from Pharma Nyaga Burhat. Let's take a look at this interview. When the product being produced by the um, pharmaceutical manufacturer plant, uh, it has its quality where it has been determined by the good manufacturing practice. Yeah? And the question here, how are we going to deliver or distribute this product to the consumer by having its quality being preserved safely and on time? This is the distribution process that we must look into and comply with the good distribution practice. In this highly regulated industry, where it requires safety and stability, movement from one product, from one end to another end, it requires you to have a good infrastructure, good system and good management to manage it. So, in other words, we have to follow the good distribution practice guidelines to manage this. So, by having this, it is difficult for us to outsource such a core business to other party. So, because there will be an adequate controls need to be put in to make sure that the delivery made throughout the distribution process are in order. Okay, to have a logistics pharmaceutical uh, facilities is to have where you need to have a good warehouse facilities in such a way that it can keep the products in accordance to their storage conditions, such as uh, some products may require you to keep below 25 degrees Celsius and some biologics may require you to keep within 2 degrees to 8 degrees, uh, degrees Celsius. To ensure that we always follow the guidelines, the good distribution practice guidelines, we have two important parties that come and closely monitor our activities. Number one is the, um, uh, from our internal auditor, from the uh, regulatory uh, department, and uh, which they come and audit us uh, frequently, uh, and two will be on a yearly basis, will be audited by the authority uh, by the name of uh, National Pharmaceutical and Regulatory Agencies. 
We also incorporate the control mechanism in each of the processors and all of this being tracked by the systems. So at any point of time, uh, before it reaches to the maximum, so system will trigger and tell us uh, to make sure that uh, we complete this exercise and complete delivery on time. In the event there is an accident, we have a procedure to counter the damage the control yeah, in a way that um, where we have a distributed uh, warehouse nationwide. We have five locations in fact. So whenever the accident happened to the nearest place from the, from the distribution center, so the team will, will, will get the information and reprocess the order made to the customers affected and will distribute from the nearest distribution center to the client. The delivery services, if you were to compare in Peninsula and also East Malaysia, they are much different. In East Malaysia, we are facing a lot of, in a way, difficulty to reach at the remote area where the mode of transport also we have to, there will be different mode of transport to reach there. Uh, there are occasions where we have to deliver right from our uh, distribution center in, in, in Kuching, for example, uh, to use a land and reach to the other area about 600 kilometers and from there we have to change mode of transport like uh, to access that place we have to use a uh, long boat yeah so these are the challenges that we face uh, especially uh, when it comes to delivery in East Malaysia in compared to Peninsula where Peninsula here the access here are very fantastic I would say and uh, within four hours, we can reach to the, des the destination without any problems. If the infrastructure is being improved at the other end or in East Malaysia, this can be solved actually by uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to access the customer much more faster uh, with uh, safety and also uh, deliver the products with the condition required as in the good distribution practice guidelines. Anda sedang merancang untuk bercuti, jalan-jalan bersama keluarga? Saksikan program Seribu Satu Destinasi Malaysia Co untuk paparan percutian yang boleh membantu anda memilih destinasi bercuti bersama keluarga dan taulan. Setiap hari Kamis pada pukul 8.30 minit malam di Bernama News Channel. Semuanya tentang anda. Mengaut keuntungan secara haram. Pendapatan nelayan tempatan terjejas musnah ekosistem negara. Hey. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Maksud nelayan asing, pendapatan kita sekarang tengah sekali merusuh. Saksikan hendap ahad ini 9.30 malam hanya di bernama News Channel. Accurate, legitimate and packed with information. First on site with reports from across the country and around the world. Be in the know through Bernama News Bulletins. Only on Bernama News Channel.
memaparkan isu semasa, rancangan, warisan dan budaya dari dalam dan luar negara. Saksikan jurnal bernama Bernama News Channel. Semuanya tentang anda. Hello and welcome back to Medical Today. I'm Jared Grutnam. Of course, in the last segment, we learned a little bit about how medication or medicines moved around the country. Very interesting segment indeed from our friends at Pharma Nyaga. We continue the show talking about dementia this time around. And joining me in the studio is Dr. Gunasundri Pushparasa, a consultant, physician and neurologist from Ramsey Saim Dabi Healthcare. Doctor, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here. My well, today to we're be. going to talk about something most of us fear we will, uh, that will afflict us when we're older, which is dementia. Now, uh, to start this conversation on dementia, what is dementia? So, okay, most people would know dementia as memory loss. Mm -hmm. But dementia is more than just memory loss. So. Memory loss only involves one domain of the brain. So with dementia, you should have involvement of more than one areas of the brain. So for example, you will have language difficulty as well, memory difficulty, then orientation. You may not know where things are. For example, in the house, where's the kitchen, where's the bathroom, mm -hmm. uh, where's the living room. Right. Okay, so but, it but tends to involve more than one area of the brain. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about that, there are lots of other problems that you're looking at also. Yes. One, one being brain tumour. You know, when you have a brain tumour, some people suffer. They become forgetful. They, they forget where they keep things. But we'll get into that later because uh, when you talk about disabilities around the world, how big a disability is this within the world? Okay, if you talk about Okay, you have two types of uh, problems, you would say, diseases which cause death and diseases which cause disability. So, neurological diseases tend to cause a lot of disability. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of dementia, I would say that it's second only to stroke. So, stroke is still the largest cause of disability worldwide. So, when you get a stroke, you can't work, you can't move. No, so that's difficult for you and the second most common cause of disability is actually dementia so when you have memory loss again it's a difficulty for you as in terms of working as in terms of someone to take care of you as in terms of planning your day-to-day -day activities so disability wise yes dementia I would say is pretty much up there mm -hmm. now when we talk about the detection of dementia uh, before the obvious symptoms appear, uh, well, what are we looking at to uh, detect the, uh, the disability? Okay, so a lot of people will say that they have some uh, mild memory loss. Is it a disability loss. or disease? Um, you, you could say it's a disease, mm -hmm. but uh, patients feel disabled by it. So right. You'd rather term it a disability. Yes, so for them, it's mm -hmm. what is disabling them. Mm -hmm. So you have to go based on the patient's symptom and patient's age. So for example, uh, if somebody who's younger, they might be just feeling the pressures of work and saying that they can't forget. It's more of a presence of mind issue for them. Mm -hmm. Whereas someone who's older complaining of uh, memory problems, you need to take them seriously because it's quite possible that they have early onset dementia setting it. So if they start saying, oh, I can't remember, so they should be taken seriously and taken to the doctor. So if I'm sitting in the office uh -huh. and I'm highly stressed uh -huh. running from place to place and I forget things down again, that's not a sign of dementia. No, that's not a sign of dementia. So as you get older, for example, above the age of 70, mm -hmm. so 10% of the population has supposed to be having memory problems setting in and as the age goes up so by the time you reach 80 so that goes up to about 25 percent right and above 85 I would say uh, more than 35 percent of the population will be having some form of memory loss so it does tend to s sort of go up quite steeply as you get older and older mm -hmm. As with uh, it is with the all different diseases, yes. you know, the, yeah. the older you get, 
uh, the more health checks you need. Now, yes, yeah. uh, you reach your, your 40th birthday, you do a, a set of tests. Uh -huh. When you reach 50, when do you start thinking about screening for dementia? Is there a screening of sorts? Um, well, we it, again, it, it's based on the patient's uh, uh, complaints. Mm -hmm. So you can get dementia when you're younger too. I'm not denying it, you can. But commonly, dementia had seen after 60. So after 60... So when you say younger, what, what's... Uh, who, so you what's can be in your 40s, you, mm -hmm. you can be in your 50s. Bad news there. Yes. Mm -hmm. But those are ge generally genetic forms of dementia. So not the commonest variants. The commonest variant of dementia is still Alzheimer's. So which is due to what we call a protein deposition in the brain called tau and amyloid. The mm -hmm. two different proteins which deposit in the brain. And this is what we call Alzheimer's disease. So younger people in their 40s, in their 50s, so they can also get, but that's more of a genetic dementia. Right. So whatever age they come in, we need to take it seriously. Okay, when you do a bit of reading, you understand that there are different types of dementia. Yes, yeah. How do you, uh, how do you break it down for us in, in the most simplest form? Okay, so the commonest that we all know, it's Alzheimer's, so which is due to tau and this amyloid mm -hmm. deposition in the brain. Okay. So there are abnormal proteins deposited in the brain. Then you have something known as vascular dementia. So vascular dementia, people who have diabetes, blood pressure, who get a lot of strokes. Now when you get a stroke, that also affects the brain function. So you can get dementia due to the fact that you're always getting strokes in the brain. Mm -hmm. Then you have different varieties like Lewy body dementia, so that's a different variety of dementia, but that looks a bit different. The person looks a little bit um, Parkinsonian, mm -hmm. a little bit of shaking, a little bit of hallucinations, uh, not quite uh, normal one day and bizarre the next day and then back to normal a day. So very fluctuating. So different types of dementia. So what I've mentioned so far, Alzheimer's still the commonest. Mm -hmm. Then you have vascular dementia. Then you have something like Lewy body dementia. Then you have all the other genetic forms of dementia which may set in when someone is younger. Now let's talk about a diagnosis of dementia or investigation. How would you as a neurologist come physician uh, investigate and uh, ascertain if a person has dementia or the, the, the different types of dementia? Okay, so when pe people come and see me for mm -hmm. memory problems, so there is a standardized uh, testing that we do. So it's like a questionnaire with a certain number of questions. So we assess functions of different parts of the brain. So we assess their memory, we assess their language, then we assess their recall, then their orientation. Do they know what day it is, what time it is, what year it is? And we assess uh, their ability to recognize and name things. So we are basically doing a quick screening of all the parts of the brain. So the brain has many different areas. So you have the front part of the brain, which is more, Im more important for uh, planning and control. Then you have the back part of the brain, more important for vision. Mm -hmm. And then you have different parts of the brain for language and memory. So there is a quick screening that we do, which sort of gives you a bird's eye view on, birds, on the brain right. function. Beyond that, Mm, we do things like MRI brain, so mm -hmm. a screening test, a scanning of the brain, so that can show shrinkage of the brain. Mm -hmm. So when you're demented, the brain will look shrunken than what a normal person has. What would you say is the gold standard of uh, diagnosing dementia? So okay, we don't have that in Malaysia just yet. Mm -hmm. So it's ten, it is a, tends to be more in research centres. So we have this amyloid and tau PET imaging, PET. So it's not an MRI, it's an imaging called PET. So that can pick up this amyloid deposition in the brain and tau deposition in the brain. Again, even in advanced countries like UK and US and Germany, they also don't do this for the general population. It's just more done as a research setting. So when you use this machine, to pick up the amyloid and the tau, you can see early deposition. Now when you see the early deposition, at that stage the patient may not be demented. Mm -hmm. So it's, you're just picking it up early, but the dementia may set on 10 or 20 years later. So the thing about dementia is, it actually goes on for about 20 years until you have a symptom.
-hmm. So there's a very long window from the deposition of amyloid and tau to actually seeing the obvious effects of the dementia. Right. Uh, we're going to take a break in a short while and come back talking about Alzheimer's. But for those of us who are in our uh, 60s, early 60s, mid 60s, what would be your advice or tip with regards to uh, making sure that you know your uh, mental health and also your brain function health or, or your brain function? Mm, what well, can we do? They say there's you know, exercises you can do, yes. you know, keep yourself busy, uh, make sure you're, you're doing puzzles, uh, things like that, keeping, your, uh, giving, uh, keeping brain activity go, uh, going. Uh, what would you advise? So, keeping brain activity going is actually very important. Mm -hmm. So, they find that people with higher levels of education are actually, to some extent, protected against dementia. So, in a, in a child or in a younger person, it's quite easy, they go to school. So, they keep studying, they keep learning. So, how do you do that in, in, in the... Uh, in your golden years. In your golden years, yes. Mm -hmm. So, the, the trick behind this is, even any form of informal learning is also useful. So, for example, you should um, pick up a new hobby. Don't do the same hobby again and again. Mm -hmm. Go and change hobbies. So, that stimulates the brain to learn again. Or pick up a new sport. Right. Pick up a new sport. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, or pick up a foreign language. Open a different language. New neural pathways, yes, so to speak. You're opening up new neural pathways in mm -hmm. the brain. Mm -hmm. Or it can be as easy as trying a different food. Right. So that's stimulating the brain in a different way. Mm -hmm. So the, the trick is to keep the brain constantly, not I wouldn't say constantly stimulated, but you need to rotate, not keep doing the same thing again and again. Right. Uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come back after the break, uh, we're going to delve into Alzheimer's from dementia. We're going to delve into Alzheimer's. We're currently talking to Dr. Gunasundari Pushparasa, a consultant physician and neurologist from Ramsey Saim Dabi Healthcare right here on Medical Today BNC. Stay with us, we'll be back after this break. Tak ada idea nak makan apa? Ah, parat, parat, mari, mari. Tak tahu nak makan kat mana? Wow, inilah pencuci mulut yang saya tunggu-tunggu ni. Ada banyak kedai makan dengan seribu satu menu yang saya boleh cadangkan. Ah, tengoklah. Oh. Dia punya sedap tu memang ada kelas lah. Ha, anda kenalah tonton koleksi tapak apa setiap selasa 4.30 petang. kerana dah ada syabu. Ha, ini anak minyak lah ni. Ha, sampai masuk buat khabar lagi. Eh, eh memalukan eh, kapal kita. Eh, ini anak minyak ni. Hei. Eh, betul lah. Eh, Yang Mek, dah ada akulah. Bukan mak akulah. Kau tengok sendiri. Weh, pekal. Weh, Siti. Ayah kau mati sebab dah ada kan? Minggu depan, kalau kau nak bayar, lagi teruk daripada yang aku buat. Siti takut. Siti jangan takut Mama ada sayang. Jangan biarkan keluarga anda menderita kerana dadah.
laporan pelbagai dimensi memaparkan isu semasa lancongan warisan dan budaya dari dalam dan luar negara saksikan jurnal bernama bernama News Channel semuanya tentang anda Gain insights from the people with the capacity to translate vision into reality. Interviews with corporate leaders. Monday, only on BNC. Hello and welcome back to Medical Today. We just discussed uh, dementia a short while ago. Uh, with me in the studio still is Dr. Gunasundri Pushparasa, a consultant physician and neurologist from Ramsey Syme Derby Healthcare. Uh, let's discuss Alzheimer's. Now, when we talk about Alzheimer's, where do we begin with this? What is different from Alzheimer's and dementia? Just, just so we're clear, you did mention it before. Uh, just give us a run through of what it is again. So dementia is a very broad term mm -hmm. uh, covering many different types of uh, memory loss, you would say. Mm -hmm. And Alzheimer is the most common uh, variant in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and Alzheimer is actually due to, like I mentioned earlier, is the amyloid and the tau deposition in the brain. Right. More than what it should be. So as you get older, more and more amyloid and tau will get deposited, causing the dementia. Basically, you have stuff stuck to your brain. That's yeah. right. That's mm -hmm. right. So, uh, okay. The thing about dementia that I would like people to know is, it takes twenty years to get it. So there's a very long window of opportunity for us to actually intervene. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get some, if it's something takes 20 years, so the window is quite wide for us to prevent it actually, in that right. way. So some people are of course more predisposed than others. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's mainly the message I like to tell people that it's not something that you develop overnight. It's not even five years, the window goes back to 20 years. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're going to get uh, dementia in your 60s, by right the process is starting in your 40s. So your lifestyle in your forties is actually very important. Right. You know you so can't how, you can't how decide. You live your life, but just past forty is a very crucial time. It's a very crucial time. Mm -hmm. So you can't say after sixty I'm going to start uh, doing everything right. I'm right. going to enjoy maximum till I'm sixty, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to take a break. And no, because it starts setting in after. Uh, it takes twenty years. So if you logically think about it, what you do in your forties is very important for you. Right. So the, the risk factors, well, what, what do you think are the risk factors at this point? Okay, so they have done some studies and mm -hmm. they've discovered that there are some factors which are preventable and to a certain extent, dementia can be prevented to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. There's also a genetic component to it. So what are the factors which uh, I would say risk factors for dementia? So diabetes is one, uh, blood pressure, uh, if you're very overweight, obese, that's also a risk factor. If you're physically inactive, they found that exercise helps keep the brain cells young. So we all know about the effects of exercise in keeping your muscles young. You tend to look younger, uh, you're more fit. It also has a role in keeping the brain cells young. Mm -hmm. So it's not just exercise for physical body, it's also exercise for the mind in that way. Mm -hmm. So you're basically when you do exercise, it sort of increases the circulation mm -hmm. and keeps the neurons in a better state. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. you have things like, like I said, education. So education is a very, very important factor. They found rates of dementia lower in more uh, educated people, uh, college educated, people with one degree, two degree, people who participate in lifelong learning have a lower chance of dementia than, let's say if you finished uh, after SPM or and then just started working and never sort of went back to learning. Mm -hmm. But learning can be informal, like what I was saying right. earlier on. Just pick up a new hobby, pick up a new sport, pick up a new language, 
travel. Travel is another factor which stimulates the mind. Because no two roads are the same, no two shops are the same, no two buildings are the same. So all that, all the different things you do in life uh, helps with uh, yes. brain activity. Forming yeah. new neural pathways. Mm -hmm. So that way education is very important. If you are forming new neural pathways so in the brain. So when they say a learning curve is lifelong, so it, there, there's, there's a lot of truth. There's a lot of truth to it and mm -hmm. we have also found that it protects you against dementia. So that's an added benefit. Right. You see, so and then hearing loss is another factor, risk factor for dementia. Now, you may ask me, what has hearing loss got to do with dementia? So when you can hear, your brain is more stimulated. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a stimulation factor for the brain. Right. So if you're not hearing, you're actually not stimulating yourself. So the eyes and the ear, and the ear they are what get the input from the external world. Right. So if you have hearing loss, your brain is less stimulated compared to a normal person. Let's talk about the advancement in treating dementia. Uh -huh. How far have we come, say, in the last 10 years? Okay, uh, I won't say that the drugs that we have these days, are uh, they don't cure dementia. They sort of slow down the progression only. So, for example, if you're declining, uh, your function is declining. Mm -hmm. So the drugs just slow down the progress. They won't reverse the function. Mm -hmm. But all said and done, uh, there are trials going on uh, overseas to look for a cure for dementia. So remember, dementia has a 20-year window. Right. So they are trying to identify patients early and give them anti-amyloid therapy and see whether it works and stops the dementia from going on. Mm -hmm. But those are all under clinical uh, trials right now. Right. So uh, it's, it's still under trial. There's, yes. there's no... Uh, published a published paper to say that they found something as a cure no as no. a cure no there mm -hmm. were some vaccine trials early on but they didn't work and they sort they failed so the cure is still ongoing right uh, of course in your area of speciality uh, there it has its fair share of myths a lot of uh, uh, snake oil sellers out there who will come and say take this and take that and you will never develop dementia have you heard of any of these um, well, uh, yes and yeah. no, but uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I would say that none of it actually works. So mm -hmm. you, you sort of need to uh, realize that mm, whatever they're selling to you, it's probably not going to work. So right. a lot of lifestyle factors involved. Mm -hmm. you know, so if you ask me, uh, all the things that people tend to do, your diet is important. Uh, exercise is important. Mm -hmm. Go for your regular health, health checkups. Make sure you're not overweight. Make sure you don't smoke. Smoking is another risk factor for dementia. You know. Right. And then keep learning. Keep learning. The learning part is very important. And travel doesn't have to be overseas. You know, you can even go to another city, go to another shop, take a different road to work. That's mm -hmm. also learning because the road is different, and you have to pay attention. Right. So all these little things you do. Uh, breaking out of your routine yes. will help you uh, keep the neural pathways growing mm -hmm. and, and of, of course uh, keep you thinking a lot which will help in uh, evading or staying away from dementia. Yes, right. and there's another lifestyle factor that many people are not aware of. So mm -hmm. it's not all wise tale when people tell you to lead a healthy life. So for example, depression also can lead to dementia. Depression mm -hmm. is also a risk factor. If you're socially isolated, you don't have friends, you don't mix, that's also a risk factor for dementia. Right. Of course, I'm going to digress a little mm -hmm. uh, because you brought up depression. Uh -huh. For people who are suffering from depression and who are on uh, drugs for depression, yes. say enzolytics and uh -huh. uh, the other SSRIs and SNRIs, uh, are they at risk of developing dementia? Um, not if they're taking medication, but mm -hmm. if their depression goes untreated, then they could be at risk of getting dementia. Right. So depression by itself is a risk. Mm -hmm. So be happy or mm -hmm. try to be happy because depression is challenging. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people need medication. Some people just need a change in attitude and change in expectations of what they expect out of life. And then social isolation. Some people need to have expectations. <laughs> true, true, true. So social isolation as well. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to have friends, you need to have family, you need to have a network 
or join an association that you're passionate about. Right. That that form of connection and connectivity mm -hmm. does stimulate the mind and ward off dementia too. Right. Okay, and sleep. Mm -hmm. I forgot so to bring I, this up. I think our takeaway from all this uh -huh. is to keep yourself busy at all times. Try yes. to get you know for as long as you're alive, do things or yes. get things done. So you need to uh, be busy, mm -hmm. not too busy, then your brain is overstimulated. Yeah. So imagine, uh, just remember the lifelong learning that you need to do. Keep changing your hobbies every now and then. Keep changing your routine every now and then. That stimulates the brain, develops new neural pathways and live a healthy lifestyle that prevents dementia. So right. smoking, uh, avoid depression, don't be social, socially isolated, have friends, have family, mm -hmm. have a network, and sleep well. Sleep is very important to prevent right. dementia. Uh, with that, we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gunasundari Pusparasa, a consultant physician and neurologist from Ramsey Syme Darby Healthcare, walking us through dementia. Thank you very much, Doctor. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, pleasure being Stay here. Stay with us. Uh, we're going to come back with more for you right here on Medical Today. Uh, we'll be back just after a break. Anda ingin menjadi kaya, tetapi awas. Terdapat banyak skim-skim pelaburan tidak sah di pasaran. Jika ragu-ragu, anda boleh jumpa kami untuk memahami formula TIPU. Apa itu TIPU? T tidak akan rugi. I indah kabar dari rupa. P peluang hanya sekali. U untung besar. Ingat dan berwaspada dengan formula TIPU ini. Untuk sebarang pertanyaan mengenai pasaran modal, anda boleh hubungi kami. Anda sedang merancang untuk bercuti, jalan-jalan bersama keluarga? Saksikan program Seribu Satu Destinasi Malaysia Ko untuk paparan percutian yang boleh membantu anda memilih destinasi bercuti bersama keluarga dan taulan. Setiap hari Kamis pada pukul 8.30 minit malam di Bernama News Channel. Semuanya tentang anda.
准、可靠、及时。马新社新闻台华语新闻，让您掌握全国与全球信息。Hello, Malaysia, and welcome back to the final segment of Medical Today. We did talk about logistics and moving medication around. We also had, or rather, received an in-depth understanding on what dementia is. For now, let's talk about diabetes in Malaysia. What's the trend, the myth, and what's new? Joining me in the studio is Dr. Fu Siu Hui. She is a consultant endocrinologist from Ramsey Syme Davi Healthcare Doc. Thank you very much for taking time off to be with us. Now, uh, the current state of diabetes in Malaysia, apparently half of Malaysia has diabetes. Or, uh, that's too exaggerated, but the numbers are quite out there. Yeah. What, what is the situation at this point? So, I mean, the uh, current state of diabetes, I think probably people have been aware that we are definitely getting more and more more people with diabetes with increasing prevalence. So the latest figure for information, we got it from the 2015 National Health Mobility Survey. So the, a, which we sample um, uh, the community age 18 and above, the current number stands at 17.5%. So what it means is that uh, more than every one in six individuals so will be diabetic. So the, the problem that's worrying about this survey is that we found that out of this 17.5%, more than 9%, which is more than half of it, were actually undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. so, so meaning that, you know, more than half the people don't even know they're diabetic. Right. So, so but for the past problem. 10 years, we've been running some uh, pretty fantastic uh, campaigns, awareness campaigns yeah. mm -hmm. around the country. Uh, it's still falling on deaf ears or are people in denial? Right, so it now comes down to the issue of awareness, right? Is it, is it all about awareness? Um, I think partly yes, but partly no. Um, what, uh, because I think I'm sure in the press, the media, we have done a lot of work on, on the awareness of diabetes, the World Diabetes Day, and people are actually aware. But um, so only unless you know you're out of this world, then you know. But, but the problem is when you're aware, and do you actually get yourself screened? So um, there are a lot of uh, campaigns, you know, getting people to get themselves screened. But people often, you know, the, the host high-risk people, high-risk people mean, you know, if you are like, have weight problem, if you have strong family, they, 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 they are like, they, they tend to run away from screening. And the people who come for screening are actually those who are like, very, um, they are health conscious, you know, right. they are physically fit. And you know that, you know, mm -hmm, they, they are mm -hmm. not the one that, Basically, screened. people don't want to know bad news. Yes, yeah. yes. And yes, and one of the mm -hmm. mentality they, they because diabetes is asymptomatic disease. You know, you don't feel it until the disease has got complication. So, so people tend to run away from their reality. They, oh, I don't want to know my numbers. I, I just, I just do what I can do. That if I'm doing it, that, and, and all, they will only get themselves screened if there's really complications. I mm -hmm. say, yeah. Now, with regards to screening, uh, the gold standard is still the HbA1c. Isn't it? Is that the gold standard? For screening? Yeah. Right. Uh, actually, there was something that recent. HbA1c, what it means is a laboratory test that uh, tells you what is your sugar, uh, average sugar in the last three months. So in the past, actually, it is not uh, validated. But, but because of this problem that I was talking about, that people do not come for screening. Like, um, so uh, the good thing about this HbA1c is when you do the blood test, you do not need to be fast. Mm -hmm. right? So that means that if you have a patient who come in to see you just for cough and cold, and the patient say, oh, uh, by the way, I would like to offer to check you for diabetes uh, because y you know you have weight problem. Um, but the, the doctor, the, the, the patient will say, but I'm not fasted, no problem. Mm -hmm. I can do your A1C. You can still do it. Right, yeah. so, so that's called opportunistic screening. That's one of the reasons why we have uh, recently validated HbA1c as a test mm -hmm. that you can use it to diagnose diabetes. Right. Are there better tests out there now? More accurate tests, so to speak? I mean, um, there's no perfect test in this world. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the past, I mean, if you follow the uh, World Health Organization definition, there is um, 
there is two, the conventionally we, we, we fast the patient, we fast the patient and we check their sugar and there is also an option of challenge them with the glucose, we call it oral glucose challenge test Correct. where and then you, you check the sugar after challenge, mm -hmm. right. So because these tests are not conducible in the sense that you, you can't, you, it doesn't allow you to do opportunity screening because you have to fast and then you have to go through the challenge. So, so that's, that's where A1C come in. It's not a perfect test, but it's got, um, it's got its uh, values because of this one, one main thing is opportunistic and also um, it's a test that you can even do, you know, at uh, there and then point of care because you, nowadays we have machine where you can actually do it then and then you get the results but immediately. You know, if you're going to get, if you're predisposed with, they say that I'm of Indian origin and uh, I'm predisposed to diabetes <coughs> plus family history makes it worse for me. Yeah. Now, with all this information at hand, the best I can do is lead a healthy lifestyle and take care of my sugars. Is that right or is there more to that? Yeah, I think it's fine. I mean, if, if you know that you are predisposed, you, of course you try to engage the lifestyle that's as healthy as possible and uh, you get yourself screened. Uh, I mean, I would say uh, once you reach a, a certain age, let's say, I would say if you're high risk, you probably should start screening at 30 or even consider earlier if you have a weight problem mm -hmm. and you get yourself screened every year. Right. And then because the thing about diabetes is if you get diagnosed early, it's very easy to treat. And mm -hmm. you can remain stable for many, many years because you just, you just get control. You just make sure it's very well controlled and, and your disease doesn't progress. But as opposed to sometimes what we're seeing now, you come in with a sugar of 20, you know, your, your disease will progress very fast. Because you came in already, you know, your disease is very much established as opposed to you coming with a mildly elevated sugar. So it's mm -hmm. easier to intervene in the early stage. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what do you think is the most worrying trend in Malaysia with regards to uh, diabetes or the understanding of diabetes mellitus? Right. The, what we have noticed is uh, in the recent years is we are seeing more and more young people with diabetes. I mean, what we talk about is the type 2 diabetes, not those, you know, the uh, type 1 diabetes, which is a separate topic. So type 2 diabetes related to lifestyle, related to obesity. So um, we are seeing more and more. Um, so you, or every now and then, you see people turn up to you and, oh, I'm only 16. Uh, why am I getting diabetes? But you, you see that, you see that. So, um, yeah, but, that, that's But everyone very, very by and large blames it on uh, the food we eat right now, you know, we've sort of embraced the uh, fast food culture and that is that a contributing factor or one of the main factors as to why right. this is um, prevalent? Yeah, so among these young people with diabetes, <coughs> yes, definitely one of the factors is because of this uh, environment that we have now, we call it obesogenic. Mm -hmm. So because uh, lifestyle, you know, we have very high we, the, the food that we, we, ha we, ha we have is like very energy dense, so healthy lifestyle people have obesity weight gain. That's one of it, but that doesn't explain all. The other problem that we are seeing is as opposed to this, you know, people are getting diabetes younger. Okay. Now we are also seeing young women who are of the childbearing age, mm -hmm. before, they, before they get pregnant, they are already diabetic. Or right. sometimes they get diabetes during pregnancy, what so we call gestational, gestational di diabetes. And, and that's very prevalent yeah, too these days. Yeah, so we are seeing more and more. And, and not all the time, in fact, most of the time, they, the sugar is not that well controlled um, before they conceive. And, and automatically, um, so all these uh, uh, babies, I mean fetus we call them medically, so when they, con when they conceive in the environment, when the sugar is high. So this environment is very unfavorable. So what happens is when this baby was born and they grow up, so they are automatically predisposed to getting diabetes at a very young age. So this, this got nothing to do with the gene. This is because of the um, very unfavorable uterine environment, which make them program in such a way that you, they will be predisposed to diabetes at a very young age. Even mm. if, you know, I mean, they just have to be a little bit chubby and they don't have to be all what the obese then they will get it. So, so that's another reason as well. Right. And before we talk about the latest developments, and there have been a lot of promising stories about uh, insulin now, they have coming up with insulin patches so on and so forth. But before we get to that, let's talk about the common myths and misconceptions. A mm -hmm. uh, little area I like very much because I listen to a lot of my friends talk about how they can reverse diabetes mm -hmm. and how boiling certain plants will help you and how big pharma is trying to, you know, uh, squeeze the, the common man and take his money. But, uh, and, you know, a lot of people are just going out there and selling all these uh, 
supplements that don't work. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, from the layman point of view, I mean, in general, people like to listen, oh, this pill, this, this is natural, it's called natural herbal product, will I mean, make your diabetes must, must, disappear. Must cure, yeah, yeah that, that is very appealing. This is called about marketing strategy, right? So, so I mean, as a layman, you, you don't, I mean, you're not a scientist, you're not a medical, you don't look at the evidence behind it. Oh, this sounds very appealing to me. Mm -hmm. Then I will forget about the pills from my doctor and, and I'll just take this natural. natural. It's just, people like to. Or your you best know? friend will come to you and say, forget about what your doctor has given you. Take this. Uh, my diabetes will disappear. I don't have to see my doctor every two, three months. Yeah, yeah. So, so those, that was a misconception. I mean, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, nowadays, yes, diabetes in certain situations, it can be reversed, but not with this sort of thing, you know? I mean, of course, um, if you but, have... But, but when you say it can be reversed, which means you can be go, going back to the lifestyle, the unhealthy lifestyle you had, that can't happen, isn't it? No, what yeah. I mean is that if this is a certain condition that tight and tight with it, if your diabetes is very much newly diagnosed and your sugar is just mildly elevated and then um, you you go on to this uh, very intensive lifestyle, meaning that you know your diabetes is it, you just get detected after this glucose challenge test but you just pass the the cutoff point of 11.1 so, so there is a chance that if you have active lifestyle you know you lose a lot of weight mm -hmm. a lot of time like if you have a lot of excess weight you lose a lot of weight you, you, you can potentially reverse that. That's where it comes, you know, we talk about bariatric surgery. Right. So, um, so sometimes you see, you know, you're like 150 kilo mm -hmm. and you, you, your sugar is 7.1. Of course, your sugar is 7.1, but you're 150 kilos. So right. you shed that weight, you likely could your diabetes get mm -hmm. reversed. So, if so that, that was a context. you bariatric surgery, mm -hmm. we did talk about that a few weeks ago right. in order to help with the NCDs, right? Yeah. So uh, there's, there's a lot of developments in uh, the fight against diabetes, mm -hmm. you know, or to kind of uh, uh, reach out to people with diabe diabetes and help them with treatment. Now, what's the latest development in terms of treatment? Okay, in terms of treatment, yeah, I mean, um, medication, certainly there's a lot of development. So in the past um, 20 years ago, we only have insulin and one or two oral drugs. Nowadays, we have globally, we have up to 10 classes, different types of medication. So what happened in the past few years is that this uh, newer drug that is being developed for diabetes um, has, um, there's very high, they, they have achieved a uh, very high standard. What it means is that on top of controlling your sugar, it, they, they tend to um, be friendly towards other aspects of your health, like they help you to reduce blood pressure. We know that most diabetes have high blood pressure. They may potentially help you to lose weight as well, as opposed to when you take uh, some other older generous machine, you actually gain weight. Mm -hmm. And also, they even now may protect your kidney and your heart. they coming up drugs now. Yeah, so this is a later generation of the drug when they, they were trying to prove that in fact some of the agents have actually proved it. Mm -hmm. The other thing of course you talk about surgery is also one of the options. Um, the third option is of course, um, we talk about technology as well. So the, the technology is also coming in when you have a different way of administering insulin, you, the, 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 the pump and then the pump can auto suspend if you have hypoglycemia, meaning you have low blood sugar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you have uh, gadgets with monitoring when you have flash glucose monitoring. Um, so there's a lot of technology involved. So it depends on what kind of lifestyle you want. Yeah. Right. Mm. Uh, with that, before I let you go, we've got about 30 seconds left. What is the future direction or goals for diabetes within Malaysia? Okay, so definitely one of the most important things we need to do is to prevent diabetes and that has to start at a very young age. We need to prevent uh, childhood obesity and to, in order to prevent this uh, epidemics of young people getting diabetes because if you get diabetes very young, it's going to place a very heavy burden on the um, country you know mm -hmm. in terms of the social economic you know you will lose your ability to work so so that come back to public health public health where we uh one thing apart from awareness i think we we need to have this um uh to make healthy food more accessible uh subsidized like you know subsidized vegetables uh fresh food we know mm -hmm. sometimes fresh food is not that cheap and sugar i mean <laughs> i mean right. there was recent it doesn't controversy. need to be subsidized yeah, yeah. That's my personal opinion. Yes, because mm -hmm. if you look at Western countries, not only is not subsidized, there is a sugar tax. Right. So, I mean, people are easy to know. Sugar and condensed milk is very cheap. Mm -hmm. So, so if, you have, if you have restricted, you have financial constraints, you will tend to go to the refined right. uh, 
refined uh, you know, unhealthy food, mm -hmm. then that is unfortunately is it's going to make your problem worse. Right. You know, it add up to the healthcare cost. So that's a little something we yeah. should look at. Yeah. Subsidies for sugar and whatever that comes along with it. On that note, we'd like to thank Dr. Fu Siu Hui, a consultant endocrinologist or endocrinologist, sorry, from Ramsey Syme Dabi Healthcare, joining us right here on Medical Today to talk about diabetes and that problem in Malaysia. In the meantime, if you do have questions for us and if you want to forward questions uh, to our medical practitioners on the show to get some answers, send your questions to ask at medicaltoday.my, that's A-S-K, and medicaltoday.my. And when you send your questions in, we're not only going to send you your answers, what we're going to do is furnish you with a bottle of vitamins courtesy of Pharma Nyaga, right here on Medical Today, only on BNC. Have a great weekend and a fantastic week ahead. I'm Jared Rutnam signing off. Take care and bye-bye.